Okay, let's talk about uh, this idea of going from higher index to lower index, and let's talk about something called total internal reflection. So in our pool, when we had an interface, and we took, let's say we take a, a flashlight, okay, and we take it underwater with us, Here's our flashlight, and we're going to shine it towards the surface. We know that that light ray is going to bend, and it will bend away from the normal. So there is the surface normal, and if this is water, and this is air out here, then this thing will bend away from the normal, so it bends like that. Okay. But what happens when I start to increase this angle? In other words, let's move my flashlight up to this position. And now let's shine that ray at the surface, and I'll try to do it in a different color. Where is the light going to go? Well, it again bends away from the normal, and eventually it's going to go right along the surface. And if I keep going, if I keep moving my flashlight up, eventually I'm going to get to a position where the light never leaves the water. Okay? I can't bend any further away from the normal, and so all the light does that. And that is what's called total internal reflection. Now, total, total internal reflection only happens when you go from high index to low index. And it happens when that transmitted ray equals 90 degrees. Okay? So let's see if we can write this out mathematically. We know that Snell's law holds. Ni sine theta i equals nt sine of theta t. Ni in this case was water. Okay? Theta i is the incident angle, but at a very special angle called the critical angle, the transmitted ray is at 90 degrees. Okay. What is the sine of 90 degrees? Is it 0 or is it 1? It's 1. So we get Ni sine theta c equals Nt, since we're just multiplying by 1. And now you can identify what this critical angle is. Theta C is equal to NT over NI. And then I better move that over because we've got to write the arc sine in there. Arc sine of NT over NI. If this is water and air, let's calculate what theta C is. And you guys punch it into your calculator. So we're going water to air. Theta C is equal to arc sine of NT. Remember, this is what it's transmitted into, which is air. So that is 1. NI is what it came from, which is water, 1.33. So what is the arc sine of 1 over 1.33? Sean, do you have a number for us? So this orange one, which is at the critical angle, is 48.75 degrees. 
anything higher than that, namely the pink one, you don't have the light exiting the water. It all stays inside the water. And this is a really fun experiment to try. But next time you're at you know, a swimming pool um, and you can get the water pretty flat and calm, go underneath the water and look across the pool. And what you'll see is if you look straight up, you can see the sky. As you start to look at an angle further away at that water interface, you got to do this underwater, of course. As you start to look away, you can still see the sky, still see the sky, and then when you get to this magic angle, 49 degrees, you can't see the sky anymore. Okay? The water surface becomes a perfect reflector, and all you see then is the other side of the pool. It becomes a perfect mirror, and it's sort of interesting when you do that. In fact, if you lay on your back underneath the water and you hold your breath so there's no bubbles disturbing the surface, and you look straight up, you'll see a cone of sky above you, and then outside of that cone, it will be a mirror. You will see the bottom of the pool. It's really kind of a fun experiment to try. Where else do we see total internal reflection? One place you see it is in fiber optics. Okay? Fiber optics are pieces of glass, not water of course, but pieces of glass, and you want to keep light in the glass. How do you do it? Well, you come in at a very shallow angle such that when it hits the edge of the glass, it all stays inside the glass. Okay? And it just bounces back and forth all the way down the fiber optic length. And this is, of course, the backbone of the internet. This is how you're seeing me right now. A lot of the signals that you're seeing me are coming through fiber optic cables right now. But there's another example of total internal reflection and it's sitting right in front of us, okay? This piece of glass right here has total internal reflection going on right now. Around the edge of the glass, there are strips of high power white LEDs. That LED light is staying inside the glass. It's bouncing back and forth on the edges of this glass and it's just going back and forth all the time. It doesn't come out of the glass because total internal reflection keeps it inside the glass unless you do something to the glass. Unless you put something on the glass, then it will pull the light out. So for instance, if I take my hand and I put it right here, all of a sudden you can see that light get pulled out. Okay? And in fact, if you look closely, you can probably still see some of my fingerprints on the glass. Or you take a pen and you write on the glass, and that ink will pull it out. And this is called frustrated total internal reflection. You've added something to the surface which pulls that light out of the glass, and now you can see it. Uh, let's talk uh, about lenses now. Now that we understand Snell's law and this idea of the index of refraction, how does this apply to lenses? Well, let's think about the following picture. Let's say I have a piece of glass and I curve it like so. Okay. What's going to happen to the light that goes through this piece of glass? All right, we know that a light ray that is normal to the surface doesn't bend at all, right? If it's normal to the surface, theta i is zero, theta t is therefore zero. So it will continue straight on through and head off in that direction. Okay? Actually, that's a solid line in there. What about a light ray that comes in near the top of the lens? Well, this glass is curved right there, and so it's going to bend down just a little bit and then it sees another curve on the other side, and so it's going to bend down a little bit more. And it takes a path like that. A light ray on the bottom side sees a curve, it bends a little bit there, and then it bends more, and it all goes through like so. Each ray obeys Snell's law. 
if you design this glass just right, you can get all those rays to come to the focus, F. And this, of course, becomes a thin lens. Okay, so it's kind of cool when you think about it because glass you can make from silica, right? You take a bunch of sand, purify it a little bit, melt it down, carve it into this shape, and all of a sudden it does something very special to the light that goes through it. And now you can use that glass to help people see better or make a telescope or make a microscope. Okay, you can make all these really cool elements just by carving this glass appropriately. All right, this is what a lens looks like. There are a bunch of different types of lenses and let's identify a few of them. So this is curved on the first side, curved on the second side, and therefore it is called biconvex. Okay. If it is curved the other way on the first side and curved the other way on the second side, then it is called biconcave. Okay. Remember, cave is the one that you can crawl into. So if you can crawl into this cave, it's concave, bicon, biconcave. But they don't have to be curved on both sides. You can just have it curved on one side. And so if I curve it on one side, like this, this is called plano convex. Plane on one side, convex on the other. And likewise, if I do it the other way, then it's called plano concave. Okay, and these are four of the typical lenses. There is a uh, table in your book, figure 2331, that talks about a few other kinds of lenses. Now, if it's a thin lens, then we are not worried about the thickness of the lens. We don't have to really worry about what's happening in the interim. It really only depends on what's happening out here at the focal position. Once you get into advanced optics, you start talking about thick lenses where there is a substantial amount of glass in between the two curvatures, and then you have to worry about the propagation in between them. Whenever you're designing an optical element like for a 35 millimeter camera, you really have to take into account the curvature and the thickness of the glass itself. And if you have a nice 35 millimeter telephoto lens, there will be something like 30, 40 elements in that lens, okay? You'll have all these different lenses one after another, and the goal is to create a good image. And it's not easy to do that with just one lens. You need a whole bunch of lenses to get color correction, to get rid of spherical aberration, all sorts of those problems. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about the lens and how we might form images with the lens. Okay, we're going to go back to our three rules that we had before and see how to apply those. Let's start with a simple picture. Here's our optic axis. Let's put our thin lens right here. And that thin lens has a focal position, F, on either side and it's symmetric. Okay, if it's a symmetric lens, then you have symmetric focal positions, and this is part of being thin lens. All right, let's put our object out here somewhere. How about right there? That's our object. And now we want to figure out where the image is. Okay, how do we form that image? To do that, we go back to our three rules. And it's the same three rules that we used for the mirrors, except now we're going to use a lens. All right, rule number one is parallel rays go through the focus. Okay, same as we had before. Two, like we said, is really that one in reverse, rays through focus.
goes parallel. Okay, and the last one, number three, is rays through the center. Do not bend. Same rules that we had before. We got to identify where the center is, right? We knew where it was for a curved mirror. It was the center of that radius of curvature. But here, for a thin lens, the center is, in fact, right in the center of the lens. Okay? All right, so let's see how to do this. We've got our object. We need to draw some of these rays. The first one is parallel ray goes through the focus, okay? Parallel ray comes in, it's going to go through the focus. It's not going to bounce off this glass and go back to this focus, it's going to bend and go through this focus. Okay, so this is ray number one. Ray number two is going through the focus, it then goes parallel. All right, going through this focus, it then goes parallel. This is ray number two. And then finally, here we'll draw a little separator right there. Finally, we have rule number three, which is rays through the center do not bend. Now, we already have an intersection point, so you really only have to do two of these three. But just for kicks, let's draw the third one and make sure it works out. Rays through the center do not bend. That's ray number three. Okay. And these are reasonably straight. That's where the object generates an image. We know that the base of the object is still going to be on the optical axis, and so it is inverted. In this case, it looks like it is demagnified, and that is where the image is located. Okay, so those are the three rules for figuring out where that image is located. And it takes a lot of practice, and as you move this object in and out, it gets a little bit harder and harder to do. This is a real image. In other words, if I put a piece of paper there, I can form an image on it. Or if I put a piece of film there or a CCD array, then I can form an image right there. Okay? It is inverted upside down. And it is also, in this case, it is demagnified. But it doesn't have to be. It depends on where the object is located. As we'll see, when you move the object in closer, it can get magnified. Now, this idea of it being inverted is sort of interesting. What that means is when you have a camera and you have a lens and you're looking at a tree, the image on the film or the CCD array is upside down. Okay? But guess what? This is exactly how you view the real world. Your eye is a lens. When you look at a tree, the image on your retina is upside down. The whole world that you're seeing around you is upside down. Your brain has figured out how to not really worry about that and correct for it. But on the retina, the back of your eyeball, everything's upside down. It was, if you block half of a lens, what happens to the image? So this is kind of a tricky uh, concept, but let's think about the problem. We have a lens here. We'll put our object right here. And now we're going to form some image over here, just like we drew last time. Now, when you follow the lens rules for determining where the image is, we just drew three rays. But of course, there are rays coming off of this object in every single direction. Okay? There's essentially an infinite number of rays coming off the object. So a few of those are going to come to the lens. I drew four rays here that are coming to the lens. All four of those rays came from the tip of the object, which means they all go back to the tip of the image. Okay? Our lens rules 
just applied to one of those, okay? Then maybe when it goes through the focus, that's our second one. If it goes through the center, that's our third one. But there's really an infinite number there. So if I have four rays that are going to form my image, that means that the CCD array or the piece of film is going to pick up that much light. But if I block half of the lens, right, if I take an aperture and I just cut those out, then these last two are gone. Nothing changes with the image except its brightness. There's less light going to form the tip of the image, and so it is less bright. But it's still located exactly in the same spot, still roughly with the same crispness. It's just less intense. All right, good question. Okay. So here is our optic axis. Here is our thin lens. Okay. This is called a converging lens. It tends to converge the rays to a particular focal point. It's also called a positive lens. All right. So biconvex, converging, positive, those are all essentially synonymous. So let's draw the focal point F for this lens. And now let's do the following. Let's take our object and let's put it inside the focal length. So we brought the object all the way through the focus and now it's sitting right there. Okay, This is not hard to do, right? If you take an object and hold it right up next to your eyeball, that's essentially the same idea. How is this going to form an image and where is that image? Let's follow our rules. It says that rays that are parallel are going to go through the focus. That's number one. It says that rays through the focus are going to go parallel. Well, that one's going to be a little hard to draw because if I come from this focus, it's going to miss the lens entirely. Okay? That would be our ray number two but we're not going to worry about that. Remember, there's only two of the three rules that you need. The last rule, I'm going to erase that one just for clarity. The last rule was rays through the center do not bend. All right. We can draw that one. Rays through the center do not bend. That's number three. So, where's the image? Well, it's where those two rays meet. That looks like a problem, right? It looks like they are separating. They're not getting closer together. But that means somewhere back over here, it looks like they were coming from the same point. And so all we have to do is extend this dashed line back Take this one and extend this dash line back. And they meet right there. This is the object. This is the image. Remember, dash lines mean virtual rays. It's not real light over here. It's just where you perceive it coming from. So if you're sitting over here looking at this, you see these rays one and three coming from this point over here. So is this a real object, a real image or a virtual image? It's obviously virtual. In other words, I can't take my piece of film or a piece of paper and form an image on it there. That doesn't make any sense. It's upright, okay, not inverted, because it's also pointing up above the optic axis. And it is magnified. So this is a way to see objects very magnified, is to put the object very close to the lens. And this is what you do with a magnifying glass 
ultimately we see it works with a microscope. Okay, that's what the image looks like in this case. All right, so where do you get positive lenses? Well, you go to the drugstore and you buy a pair of these. These are my reading glasses, and these have a particular power associated with them. And the power of a lens is given by P, and it is 1 over the focal length. Okay? This is 1 over meters, and this is a very special unit called a diopter. So if you have glasses, your prescription will say something like plus 3. What does that mean? It means plus 3 diopters. So if your prescription says plus 1, that's the power. What does that mean in terms of the focal length? That means it has a focal length of 1 meter. Okay. In other words, these have a, po a focal length of a little bit less than a meter. It's around plus 1. I think it's 1 and a half. Okay. What it means if you have a focal length of one meter, if you go outside and you image the sun onto the ground, that image will be one meter away. And if you go up or down with your glasses, then the thing will go out of focus. So where it's the smallest spot, where it's a crisp, sharp image of the sun is one meter away. Okay? Likewise, you can use these for magnifying glasses, right? I use them for reading, put them on like that. But if I start to pull them away from my eyes, you should see my eyes getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay, can you see that? Eh, right about there, they're pretty big. That's looking pretty funny. How's that looking, Sean? Okay, you can use these as magnifying glasses, obviously. If you have reading glasses and they are positive prescription, then they are converging lenses. You can use these to start a fire. But if it's a negative lens, it's a diverging lens, you cannot use those to start a fire. There's another thing that's really cool to do with reading glasses. When you go to you know, Walmart or you know, CVS, any place that sells reading glasses, the reading glasses are really very spherical. Okay? The lenses are spherical. If you cover them up with tinfoil, tin foil, and poke a small hole in that tinfoil, it's just like we talked about with cutting out some of the rays. The image will still be there, but it will be less bright. And so I have used these before to view partial solar eclipses. So when the moon goes in front of the sun and blocks it partially, right, you still can't look up straight at the sun, but you can image it onto a piece of paper. And if it's too bright on the piece of paper, then you just put some tin foil on your glasses to cut out part of the glass and that will make it dim. So you can try that. Buy a pair of plus one reading glasses, put tin foil on it, poke a hole in the tin foil, and then image it onto a piece of paper one meter away. You'll see an image of the sun and you can see a sharp cutout where the moon is. It's kind of a fun little experiment. Okay, that's the power of a lens. Let's talk about negative lenses and image formation negative lenses or diverging lenses. We drew a few pictures of those, but how do those form images? So here's our optic axis. A negative lens looks like this. Okay, it is a biconcave lens. And now let's see if we can figure out where this object will form an image. And now the reason that you call it a negative lens is because the focal length is in fact negative. It means you still have two focal points, but they're flipped. All right? So rule number one still applies. Light coming in parallel is going to go through the focus. But it doesn't go through this focus, it goes through that focus. 
Okay, but it doesn't bounce off this thing. It's not a mirror. It refracts, and it refracts out at an angle that looks like it was coming from the focus. Okay, and this is why you call it a diverging lens, because it diverges those rays away from the optic axis. That is ray number one. I'm not going to draw ray number two, but ray number two would go through this focus. It gets a little complicated to see it all. We're just going to go straight to ray number three, because ray number three always applies. Rays through the center do not bend. All right. Here comes my ray through the center. That is ray number three. Where those two rays meet is where the image is located. And it looks like they meet right here. Okay, this is our image. Now, it's made up of one real ray but one virtual ray, which means it's a virtual image. It is clearly pointing upwards, so it is upright. And it is clearly smaller than the object, so it is demagnified. Here's the special rule about negative lenses, diverging lenses. They only form virtual images. You can never form a real image with a negative lens. And so if you're stuck on a desert island and you have a companion that has glasses, you had better hope that those glasses are positive lenses, because you can use those to start a fire, not negative lenses. If they're negative lenses on their eyeglasses, they're not going to help you start a fire at all. And the thin lens equation is exactly the same as the mirror equation. It's the following. 1 over DO plus 1 over DI equals 1 over F. There's only one difference, which is the sign of these items. So the way they're measured is the following. This is our focal length, F. We've drawn a positive focal length, F, because it's a positive lens. When we put our object out here, that distance from the center of the lens is DO. And this is a positive number. Okay. When DO is to the left, it's a positive number. We know that it's going to form an image over here somewhere. Okay. We can use our ray tracing techniques to figure out where that is. That distance from the lens to the image is DI. And in the case of a mirror, remember, it was positive to the left and negative to the right. But for a lens, this is also positive. Okay. So all the numbers in this picture are positive. 1 over DO plus 1 over DI equals 1 over F. All right. Let's see how that applies for a real example. Let's say you want to take a picture of a tree. And we're going to say that the distance from your camera lens to the tree is 2 meters. And let's say that the focal length of your camera is pretty short. Maybe it's about like that. So that's 10 centimeters. Okay. What is DI equal to? All right. How do we do that? Well, here's our lens equation. We can just take that equation and rewrite it. And then we can solve for DI. So we have 1 over DO plus 1 over DI 
equals 1 over f. All right, so 1 over di equals 1 over f minus 1 over dl. And I can rewrite this slightly. If I multiply up by do, multiply up by f, divide by the common denominator, and now I can flip it. So what is di? It's equal to f do divided by do minus f. And now we have all those numbers. 10 centimeters is, of course, not SI units, so we need to make that SI units. What do we get? We get 0 0.1 times DO, which we said was 2. We're going to divide by 2 minus 0 0.1. And so we get 0 0.2 divided by 1.9. And so di is very close to 0 0.1, but it's a little bit bigger than that. Sean, can you punch in those numbers? I'm going to say it is 0 0.11. That's my guess. Let's see what it turns out to be. 0 0.2 divided by 1.9. Point one zero five. Point one zero five. All right, so we'll clear that up. Point one zero five. Very close to the focal length of that lens. Okay, and that was with a tree that was only two meters away. Anything further away, the image distance gets closer and closer to the focal length of the lens. And this is why point and shoot cameras or your smartphone camera can basically have things in focus very far distances out because it's all at an image distance that's nearly the same as the focal length of that little lens. Okay? All right, and the thin lens equation is exactly the same as the mirror equation. It's the following. 1 over DO plus 1 over DI equals 1 over f. There's only one difference, which is the sign of these items. So the way they're measured is the following. This is our focal length, f. We've drawn a positive focal length, f, because it's a positive lens. When we put our object out here, that distance from the center of the lens is DO. And this is a positive number. Okay? When DO is to the left, it's a positive number. We know that it's going to form an image over here somewhere. Okay? We can use our ray tracing techniques to figure out where that is. that distance from the lens to the image is di. And in the case of a mirror, remember, it was positive to the left and negative to the right. But for a lens, this is also positive. Okay. So all the numbers in this picture are positive. 1 over do plus 1 over di equals 1 over f. All right. Let's see how that applies for a real example. Let's say you want to take a picture of a tree. And we're going to say that the distance from your camera lens to the tree is 2 meters. And let's say that the focal length of your camera 
is pretty short. Maybe it's about like that. So that's 10 centimeters. Okay. What is di equal to? All right. How do we do that? Well, here's our lens equation. We can just take that equation and rewrite it. And then we can solve for di. So we have 1 over do plus 1 over di equals 1 over f. All right. So 1 over di equals 1 over f minus 1 over do. And I can rewrite this slightly. If I multiply up by do, multiply up by f, divide by the common denominator, and now I can flip it. So what is di? It's equal to f do divided by do minus f. And now we have all those numbers. 10 centimeters is, of course, not SI units, so we need to make that SI units. What do we get? We get 0 0.1 times DO, which we said was 2. We're going to divide by 2 minus 0 0.1. And so we get 0 0.2 divided by 1.9. And so di is very close to 0 0.1, but it's a little bit bigger than that. Sean, can you punch in those numbers? I'm going to say it is 0 0.11. That's my guess. Let's see what it turns out to be. 0 0.2 divided by 1.9. Point one zero five. All right, so we'll clear that up. Point one zero five. Very close to the focal length of that lens. Okay, and that was with a tree that was only two meters away. Anything further away, the image distance gets closer and closer to the focal length of the lens. And this is why point and shoot cameras or your smartphone camera can basically have things in focus very far distances out because it's all at an image distance that's nearly the same as the focal length of that little lens. Okay? All right. Kind of cool, right?